Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today's event. My name is Megan Macklin. I serve as a program manager in the UC Davis Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, where I manage the Campus Community Book Project. To begin, a couple of housekeeping items for our virtual event today. Today's event features live captioning from Otter Live Notes. To access a live transcription, locate the red live icon on the top left of your Zoom screen and select View Stream from the drop-down menu. You also can access the live stream by navigating to the link that's been put into chat. Today's event is also being recorded and the recording will be made available on the Book Project website. To protect your privacy, you have the option to rename yourself as participant. This can be done by clicking the participant icon in Zoom, then select more next to your name. We encourage you to turn on your video if you have um, that as an option available to you. It's great, especially for our presenter to see faces. We ask that you please keep yourself muted during the presentation. You are invited to ask questions in the chat during the presentation and uh, during the question and answer portion. And during our Q&A, you also can use the raise hand feature to ask your question, which you can find at the bottom of the participant menu, or go ahead and unmute yourself to ask your question. The UC Davis Campus Community Book Project promotes dialogue and builds community by encouraging diverse members of the campus and surrounding communities to read the same book and attend related events. The Book Project, a signature initiative out of the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion since 2002, advances the mission to improve both the campus community and climate, to foster diversity, and to promote equity and inclusiveness. Currently in its 19th year, the Book Project in 2020-2021 focuses on the theme of mental health and features graphic memoir, Marbles, Mania, Depression, Michelangelo, and Me by Ellen Forney. Our theme and selection are supported by a year-long program of lectures, workshops, book discussions, film screenings, exhibits, performances, and more, which this year will take place virtually. Our program culminates when author Ellen Forney comes to UC Davis on Monday, March 1st, 2021 to speak, hopefully in person, at the Mandavi Center for the Performing Arts. For more information about the Book Project program, visit our website where you can find up-to-date event information, registration links, and other resources. We also welcome your involvement, students, staff, faculty, and community members in selecting the book project featured title and in planning our annual program. If you are interested in getting involved with the book project, please send us an email or you can refer to the book project website for more information. And um, you'll see in uh, the chat right now, we've included the information for you to access the book project. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Karma Waltonen, who will present on The Adventures of Comic Book Readers versus Genre Snobs, Fighting for Respect. Karma Waltonen is a continuing lecturer in the University Writing Program at UC Davis. She is the faculty advisor for the Stand Up Comedy Club. In addition to writing and performing stand up comedy, she teaches a variety of literature and specialized writing courses, including writing in the health professions, where she emphasizes narrative medicine. Waltonen is the president of the Margaret Awood Society and editor of its journal. She is also the winner of the 2015 Academic Federation Excellence in Teaching Award. Dr. Karma, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen for everybody as we start. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you. I am not always uh, great when I have a PowerPoint going that I'm sharing and then also looking at my notes at being able to follow chat at the same time. <laughs> so I'm hoping uh, that Megan or Sunny will let me know if there's a question that won't wait until the Q&A part because I, of course, want to answer questions. Um, so I'm not talking about mental health today. I'm, I offered to do a talk early in our year uh, to really address what was on some people's mind, which is sort of, why did you pick a comic book uh, for your campus community book project? And that's because a lot of people sort of don't understand the power that modern comic books have. And so this talk is a quick history of comics in America, uh, a really quick history of that. I do want to note as I'm going through the history that I am focusing on America and on Western books. So like I'm not also trying to fold in manga and those other things from other countries. Instead, we're looking at here. Um, and when we're thinking about comics and graphic novels, one of the things that makes the vocabulary sort of difficult is that uh, you know, a graphic novel isn't always technically a novel because novel means something that's fiction. But 
like Ellen Forney's book is nonfiction, it's a memoir. And so in using the term that we use for these, we get into this messy area. Um, graphic novels, it's really a form because you can have science books in graphic novel form, you can have textbooks in graphic novel form, you can have all of those sorts of things. It's a form and not a genre. Um, and if you go up to the library on the fourth floor, we have a graphic novel section, a really wonderful one that Roberto Delgadillo has built for us. Um, but you'll notice that mixed in is every type of kind of book. The only thing that unites them is this form, um, which makes, again, talking about genre kind of tricky. And I am using the term comics and graphic novels pretty interchangeably too in what I'm doing. Um, so I need to be able to go a slide forward, come on. Okay, so hi, that's me from <laughs> University writing program. Uh, we're going to start in olden times. And even though I said I'm focusing on America, just for this first little bit, I'm going to take you back to ancient Egypt. Um, because often those of us who teach comics and graphic novels start there because it's our first examples of things that mix words and images together. And so what you're seeing usually when you're looking at Egyptian texts, especially texts with the artistic representation, is there's an alphabetic language that you're seeing. We know now, um, ever since we got the Rosetta Stone and we're able to translate it, that like when you're looking at the stuff on the side and on the top, you're looking at alphabetic words, but then there's something else going on. And so on most tombs, and this to me looks like a, a tomb painting, you get a story on the top level that's about how gods and pharaohs should be treated after death. And then what's happening underneath, intentionally underneath, is then how this person's tomb should be venerated by his or her family and his or her servants, that story is being told in pictures. And so it's ancient Egyptian writing that we can actually say is the first sort of graphic writing because it's presenting information in both ways. There, these aren't the only two ways that ancient Egyptians did it though. There were also some uh, cartouches that were for words instead of sounds, which if we really wanted to go off the rails today, we could talk about how ancient Egyptians invented the emoji, right? <laughs> so instead of the sound for eggplant, the eggplant. Uh, <laughs> that's what you got. Uh, this uh, panel that I was making for the slide is uh, called Write Like an Egyptian, which I hear with Bangles music uh, in my head. Now I'm going to fast forward several centuries um, to Robert, or sorry, William Blake during the Romantic period, who combined words and text in a way that people had not done before in English literature. Like we had illustrated novels, but you know, illustrated in the way where it's just illustrating what you're saying. It's not adding anything to the story, and that's really what we consider when we think of sort of what's a graphic novel and then just what's a kid's book with some nice pictures for the words. And a graphic novel or a comic, the pictures have to be doing part of the narrative work. And in some works, they're doing all of the narrative work. There are graphic novels with no words at all. So again, William Blake starts doing that in his text. Um, we'll go a little further into the 1890s. Newspapers had comic strips, but then this one comic strip called The Yellow Kid just exploded in popularity. Uh, I want to note that in looking for one to put on this PowerPoint, it took me several tries before I came up with one that wasn't completely racist and disturbing. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, if you go Google it. Um, but what we have to remember about when I say really popular, um, we didn't have radios in homes in 1895. And of course there was no television in 1895. So, and it's not like you were gonna go to the theater every day and watch some vaudeville. How you're getting both your news and entertainment is coming from newspapers. And what we know about that time too, is that the comic section was read by everybody. 
they did studies to show that. And so there were a lot of adults that didn't really have the literacy to read the news, but they were still reading for the comics, for the illustrations, just like the kids were. And so these weren't seen as things for little kids. It wasn't actually until the 1920s that radios came into most people's homes and you could get your news that way. Then when we hit the 1930s, um, newspapers are seen for everybody, but then these magazines start appearing. And when we think of magazines, we're not thinking what, we're not using that term the way they were. Magazines were for kids. And so all of a sudden there were these comics that were coming out specifically for children um, and they were produced by genre. So there would like be romance ones and adventure ones, sci-fi ones and mysteries. Um, and you often had heroes that would be given sidekicks and the sidekick was supposed to appeal to the younger audience, right? And so, you know, you've got, it can't just have an adult Batman, not that we had Batman back then, but you know, it's putting in the sort of Robin to say, this is for you. Now, adults read these magazines, of course they did, but, but the idea was that they were for kids. Um, we first get what we might call a comic book in Famous Funnies. And this was a collection of specific comics that were uh, being created by Max Gaines. And this was 1933. In 1938, we get this Superman guy who appears and changes things for us. It's important to note when we think about Superman and his popularity that in many ways what he represents is the model immigrant. And he was created by immigrants to the United States. So you have this person who finds himself in America, you know, sort of brought here as a child, but then comes to embody the values of that nation and to become a defender of that nation, that model of what immigration is supposed to be for so many people. He was created by uh, Siegel and Schuster, uh, Jewish immigrants. Um, Kalel, his name means godlight in Hebrew. Um, and a lot of comet scholars will note that you know he is an immigrant who has to pass as an American when he's in his uh, journalist <laughs> form. And just as many Jewish immigrants were sort of passing as Gentiles to survive. And the Jewish influence on comics is extraordinary. So Max Gaines, who produced Famous Funnies, uh, was Jewish. Siegel and Schuster were uh, Jewish. Batman is created by Bob Kane, who's Robert Kahn. Stan Lee was born Stan Lieber. So you've got this, this huge influence there. Then World War II comes. And in World War II, we get even more patriotic characters. And the first time we see Captain America, he is punching Hitler in the face. Like we all want to. <laughs> so desperately. Right there in number one, that's his job. Um, and then what happened in World War II, oh, before I go to that, um, you'll notice down at the bottom that we get Captain America's young ally, Bucky, right? So that's the kid's sidekick <laughs> that we're putting on to Captain America, America to sort of make this more appealing to children. Uh, if we wanna think about today's context, uh, Bucky is baby Yoda. Um, probably in some format. <laughs> During World War II, our soldiers were given comics in their rations, right? So here's some gum, here's some playing cards, here's some cigarettes, and here's some comics. And the American comics industry really took off at that point because, of course, they were being bought by the government to give to our soldiers. Um, and a lot of that was also of course, some propaganda, not, and I'm not using that in the negative term, but just we need to keep our patriotic spirits up. So we're going to have patriotic stories like Captain America to be given to our soldiers. While all of this is happening, in 1940, 
the Australians, and this picture comes from Bart versus Australia, the Simpsons episode, 1940, Australia said that we could not sell our comics in their country. And part of that was because they wanted to protect their comics industry because they realized that 80% of comics sold in Australia were American and that was closing out you know, their opportunities for sales. But also they found our comics to be incredibly violent. What with all the punching, <laughs> things like that. So they banned them to protect their children from excessive violence. In 1942, we get Wonder Woman. Um, and so here we see her first. Notice the skirt flared out. Uh, her costume in later years becomes a little more racy as we go through. She was, and a bunch of people probably already know this, but uh, created by William Moulton Marston. He was a psychologist. He invented the prototype for lie detectors. And of course that becomes interesting with her because her lasso's power is that if she puts it around you, you have to tell the truth. Wonder Woman is literally a lie <laughs> detector machine who can force you uh, to say things you don't want to. Uh, Molson believed that women were actually better at detecting lies he thought that uh, women had more sort of emotional intelligence and that they could be better spies even than men could be because of their ability to read a situation and to read the emotions of somebody else in the room and then to figure out what to do. Um, and so that's part of why he created this character. He did write under a fake name though, since he was a professional man. Wonder Woman uh, also gets tied into, I in, unintentionally just punned there, uh, gets tied into some BDM <laughs> issues, BDSM issues, because Wonder Woman herself, the way to defeat her is to clasp her wrist together, usually above her head, and then she's helpless and under your control, or you can get her own lasso around her, and then she's helpless and in your control. And also on Paradise Island, there's a lot of spanking. This is how you punish the other Amazons when they do bad things. In one comic, you actually see one of the characters speculating that some of these girls are messing up to get spanked. It's, it's hugely fun. I don't think, of course, that children would understand any of these references. If they're getting this, then they've already been exposed to things in the outside culture <laughs> that we're not uh, having control over. But of course, uh, for there was these adult themes um, for the adults. Oh, Wonder Woman. So for the late 40s and early 50s, um, 1945, and I was actually just telling uh, my class right before this, this, this is when in 1945, we finally had the word teenager. And this word for that space between childhood and full adulthood. And so, it's when you have a word like that, that you can market to a group like that. And for those of us around now, we might remember that we only needed the word tween when we made products for tweens. And that's how marketing works. So we coined the word teenager. Uh, Post-war America is the powerhouse of the world right after that war without, Im without immediately an obvious enemy. We entered the Cold War fairly shortly after, but there was the second where it's like, we are the, the superpower of the world. Um, and comics moved into Asia post-World War II, partially because of all those comics that our soldiers had been carrying in those territories that spread through the populations. Um, one in five comics in America in the late 1940s was a crime comic. So something like this. And then the other most popular genre was horror or terror comics. And so, you know, a lot of supernatural stuff. Um, 
1948, our comic books got banned in Canada, again, for violence. Uh, and then, of course, in the 50s, we have the Korean War, but it doesn't get the same comic book treatment that World War II had. And so we don't have comic books that are really reflecting that war in the same way. But what does happen is superheroes sort of fade for a little while because you don't need Captain America until you have the new threat. So there was a dip. Um, and then EC, which had begun as educational comics, becomes entertaining comics. Um, and what we see in a lot of comics are a subversion of many sort of traditional hegemonic values. We get, for example, in this time period, Mad Magazine for the first time, which is, is still fighting <laughs> to survive um, in our new time. But then 1954, two things happen that are important for comic studies. I don't know why they both happened in the same year, but they did. So in 1954, there was a judge named Learned Hand because of course that's the job he had to end up with after his parents named him Learned Hand. It's, wow. Um, <laughs> you're not giving the guy many options there. But what happens in 1954 is there was a court case that went before him because someone had basically plagiarized Superman. And in the plagiarizing case, Judge Learned Hand had to write with his hand um, what a superhero was. And so this is what he said a superhero was. It's a heroic character with a selfless pro-social mission. So he has to be doing this for, you know, not himself with superpowers, meaning extraordinary abilities, advanced technology, or highly developed physical, mental, or mystical skills. Someone who has a superhero identity embodied in a code name and iconic costume, which typically expresses his biography, character, powers, or origin, meaning transformation from, or from ordinary person to superhero. And then this person also has to be, quote, generically distinct, meaning it has to be in the superhero genre, not the fantasy genre, not the vampire genre, not the science fiction genre, not the detective genre. Um, and he also said that often superheroes have dual identities, the ordinary one of which is usually a closely guarded secret. So one of the fun things you can do when you're teaching graphic novels, as I have done, is to sort of ask your students to go back and look at at the different heroes that they have and decide whether it's a superhero. Um, Superman is because he fits all the definitions. The Hulk is not because he traditionally does not have a pro-social mission. He just has anger management problems, right? But traditionally he's not hulking out to save everybody. <laughs> um, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, nope. She doesn't have a costume. She doesn't have a secret identity and she's in the vampire genre. So she doesn't get to fit that. Um, you know, does this make a difference in day-to-day -day learning? No, but it is just fun to have somewhere in American jurisprudence the legal definition of a superhero, <laughs> what that might mean. Just like many of you probably have heard that a court in Ireland uh, just said that Subway bread is not bread legally because there's so much sugar in it that it doesn't fight the Irish definition of bread. But more important than what Learned Hand said, 1954 was also the year that Frederick Wortham published The Seduction of the Innocent, or Seduction of the Innocent, which was about how comic books are ruining America by ruining our children. This became a huge deal. How huge a deal? There were congressional hearings. Our Congress spent time talking about comic books and what should be done about them. And this scared everybody. Now, some of what Frederick Wortham said was true. 
there was some sexuality in Wonder Woman comics. Yeah, he saw that. And yes, there is. But some of his claims were just really silly. He argued that Superman comics would make children unable to understand physics because Superman breaks the laws of physics since he can go faster than a bullet. As if our children are dumb, um, which of course they're not. Um, he also said that comics like Superman were problematic because it insinuated that our police force was not good enough to do their jobs. And so any superhero comic where a superhero fights crime, he was saying was automatically bad because it was somehow dissing the police. So again, you know, a lot of his stuff is like, so there's no room for fantasy. <laughs> so there's no room for anything interesting. Um, but he, he was scaring the, um, the commission a lot. So what happened was the industry decided to put restrictions on themselves so that Congress didn't do it. This happened in 1938 with the film industry as well, where the film industry put a code on themselves so that they wouldn't have certain films that were banned by the rest of, of the government. So the comics code, uh, which you'd get a literal seal on your comic book that it was approved because under this, traditional values must be upheld, women must be mostly clothed, authority figures have to be respected and what that means is that the bad guy couldn't get away with it he had no matter what awful things he did he had to be caught and if a woman was too sexy she needed to get killed by the end of it those that's how you fix that problem you can still have sex and violence as long as the criminal gets caught or the lady gets killed and this is a lot like every kind of SVU and CSI roles too that we have today. This is okay for primetime TV as long as that hooker is dead. <laughs> as long as we know who did it by the end. Okay. <laughs> kind of thing. But that's the rules that they had to have in place. Um, there was also a period in the 50s, a four year period, where Britain had banned our comics again for being too violent. So then with the 1960s, 1970s, our superheroes come back, but they're coming back under the new codes. And so that changes the story a little bit. Stan Lee, Stan Lee creates Marvel. And what we see in the 60s and 70s are most of our superheroes come from some kind of nuclear accident. Because all of a sudden, after seeing what had happened with World War II and then seeing how we're using nuclear power more and more and our fear of other nuclear disasters, that seeped into our comic books. The most famous example, of course, is Spider-Man who gets bitten by a radioactive spider and that's what gives him his powers. But we've got, you know, the Fantastic Four. Um, and all these other kinds of things. But it, at the same time that you're having things like Spider-Man produced under, you know, the sort of code of comics, there are underground comics. And so here is, um, you know, this idea that we're not going to follow the code, we're not going to put the thing on. Now, what that means is that they're not sold in traditional places. But instead, you can find them more easily in San Francisco. You can find them more easily in a head shop kind of than in downtown, you know, uh, Kansas City, because they were sort of underground, which is why they're underground comics. But that that place for people who wanted comics that didn't necessarily fit other people's idea of what comics should be, it was still there for people. You just had to know sort of where to find it. Um, the the underground comics often um, criticized some of the older comics that had come before for their racism and for other problems that those other comics had had. Um, and so we've got Robert Crumb doing Zap Comics. Um, comic book stores emerged for the first time in the 70s, but they're selling mainstream stuff. And the Supreme Court said in 1973 that every community got to define what was obscene every community got to make that choice for themselves. 
And so comic book stores were really afraid to have anything racy at all because your community could decide that a woman showing her ankle is racy. And now all of a sudden that comic book is illegal to sell. And so the mainstream stores got very, very conservative. Um, the first uh, novel that we use graphic novel for is Will Eisner's A Contract with God. Um, and so we start using this language and using it specifically to say this isn't a comic book. This isn't a superhero story, but it's also not one of these, you know, gross out anti establishment books either. Instead, this, these are stories. These are novel-esque, and this is something that's supposed to be so grown up. And he, uh, Will Eisner in creating this, uh, and the Eisner Awards are named after him, those comic awards, but said he was writing specifically for people who grew up with comics and who didn't want to stop reading things with pictures intertwined, but wanted something more adult. We get American Splendor coming out of this period. We get ElfQuest, and ElfQuest changed things because this was so incredibly popular that libraries started stocking it. And before then, libraries weren't carrying comics or graphic novels at all because they were seen as puerile. But ElfQuest came out, and finally some librarians started saying, but our, our people want to read this. And aren't we supposed to have the books that they want to read? <laughs> so shouldn't we have things like ElfQuest in them? Something else that I think opens up a lot of things is that in the late 1970s, we get Superman the movie. And all of these people who were sort of discounting um, comics as things still for kids, they loved this movie, <laughs> just absolutely. And, you know, it was popular, definitely not just with children, but with adults too. And so that gave some legitimacy back to, back to comics. Um, then you have, as we're moving into the 80s, uh, things like Swamp Thing, which was a comic that resurrected a character, but gave that character a lot of psychological depth. And its success showed other comics artists, hey, my readers want more than just a really simplistic story. And it's in the 80s that you start having things sold mainstream without that comics code on them anymore. Um, we get Watchmen. Uh, and if you haven't watched the, the HBO show, I highly recommend it. It is though, the HBO show is technically a sequel to Watchmen. Everything happens after what happens in Watchmen, but it's still, still amazing. Um, and Watchmen got the Hugo Award. Um, and then, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to go back that far because I want to talk about Mouse. Um, so Mouse by <laughs> Art Spiegelman came out and really shook everything up. And even though you'd had Watchmen win the Hugo, that was still just a sci-fi award. And then Mouse started winning non-sci-fi awards, non-kid awards, and was just amazing for the sake of amazing. And it was very difficult to encounter that text and to argue that this had anything to do with children or anything that wasn't unsophisticated in it because it was beautiful and important. Um, so it began serialization in 1981. Mouse, the second volume in 1992 actually won a special Pulitzer because the Pulitzer Committee knew that they needed to give it an award, but they did not have a category yet. So they're like, special award to Mouse because we don't know <laughs> exactly what category it's in because we're still behind the times, but we have to honor this. We have to talk about what it is. And for anybody in the audience who's wondering how to get people who don't read comics to read comics, Mouse is usually what a lot of people start on. Um, this true story about Art Spiegelman's father's time in the war and in the camps, but also about what happens to someone who's been through that and then the legacy that they pass on to their children after being terrorized, tortured, victimized in that way, and whether any generation coming after that can, can free itself of that survivor guilt and all of those other things that came with that. 
Um, Sandman is being produced at this time. This is Neil Gaiman. Neil Gaiman and Alan Moore, who are both huge names in the genre, don't draw any of their own works. Uh, they have different artists do it. Sandman is unique because it's a long running series, but different issues were drawn by different artists as opposed to having a book with just an author and one artist. Um, and what changes there is that you actually get these men who are doing the writing credited, whereas often before, if you were a writer, but you weren't doing the art, you got left out. And now we actually have to push the other way where sometimes people will try to give an award for a book only to the author, but not also to the illustrator. When of course the whole point of graphic novels is that one doesn't exist without the other. And therefore that both have to be respected. Uh, Sandman is also the kind of text that you can bring people into this genre with. Um, uh, our comic book guy at uh, Bizarro World in Davis told me once that when people come in and they've never read a comic before, he and they, I don't even know where to start. I just want to try Sandman is what he gives to them. Scott McCloud in 1993 published the seminal Understanding Comics book, and this actually gave a lot of scholars and a lot of fans of vocabulary that they could better talk about things in and also a way to legitimize the study of comics, right? That here's a textbook <laughs> that you can use to look at the way that the art is used, to look at a way that the gutter, which is the space between the panel, can, is actually doing something to move time along and things like that. Um, and having that was, was a breakthrough for a lot of us. It's still used in most, especially beginning comics classrooms that there are, and that's because he does such a great job. It is, of course, as a textbook, also a textbook done in graphic novel style. So that helps it a lot. It would be weird if it, <laughs> <laughs> Although there are some books about comics that, that don't take that opportunity. And then we're in this world now with bunches of great comics that are world famous or should be world famous. And so, of course, Ellen Forney's book, which we've decided is our campus book, that it's important enough for us to be to be looking at, to be considering, to be letting in to ourselves to teach us about the things that she's talking about. And, and of course, something that's useful, not only in thinking about mental health and mental illness, but also art itself, what it means to be an artist and what it means to be building on a legacy of art. Um, I put Castle Waiting up there by Linda Medley, one of my very favorite um, comics to teach, uh, Marjan Satrapi's Persepolis, which really opened up a lot of things for people. I've had so many students who really knew nothing about the Iranian revolution until reading uh, Satrapi's work in my class. Um, and of course, Satrapi herself is drawing on lots of French comics like David B and other people for their style. Um, I put up just in, in as we're getting close to the end of the talk before Q&A, some other favorites. Um, Mark Millar's Superman Red Sun is there. Uh, it was an idea that actually came to him as a child, which he then turned into a comic as an adult, which is what would have happened if Superman's rocket had landed in Ukraine and he was raised a good little Soviet boy? And you can see how that's an interesting thought experiment. <laughs> and then you can see how like, wait, then he would be our enemy. And then Lex Luthor would be the good guy. He is the American. and you know, but it's it's a beautiful book, and I've actually taught it in international relations before as a, like an extra credit book that we read and talk about together. But um, as something to to really get you thinking about ideology and how much ideology gets in the way of necessarily doing the right thing for your populace if you're sticking to no i'm this kind of person so i have to do that have this kind of answer um ali brocious hyperbole and a half um and she just had her her second book come out but if especially if you're interested in a compelling really fun and often hysterically funny like her books make me laugh so hard i ugly cry like, you know, <laughs> kind of things. 
uh, which is why you should not read them in public, um, but, but very good for that. And then one of my favorite graphic novels of all time, which is David Mazzucchelli's Asterios Polyp. I would never start anyone there, um, but it is a masterpiece of a graphic novel. And it is a postmodern meta graphic novel because it's a visual art book about visual art. And often what is happening in the discussion of the characters who are visual artists, what they're talking about gets mirrored or contrasted or obfuscated on the page. And so each page uh, tends to be playing with a lot of what you're doing. Um, I, when I was first teaching my graphic novel course, um, I put it at the end because I see it as this sort of culminating thing and it was this thing we could build towards. But since it was at the end of the quarter, too many students were like, I'm just not gonna read that last one because it's too busy at the end of the quarter. I then in later years moved it earlier in the quarter so that they would all read it. And now the problem when I teach this course is that they complain that this book has ruined the others for them. <laughs> nothing was as sophisticated, nothing was as visually interesting. Um, and I'm like, well, blame the students who came before you <laughs> showed me that to get you to read it, I had to put it here. And then our drawback is that yeah, these other these other things look a lot simpler now that we're there. Um, but you know, that's that's where we are. Um, so I put up some some ways to contact me if you need to. Um, but now is the time for questions. I'm hoping what we saw is that these things have a long history with us. That a lot of the problems that we had, especially with violence, it's we still have those in popular culture, and the, our kids are still watching all the things that <laughs> we're watching that we think are too violent and sexual. So it's not like anything's changing there. But that there's also a, a big world around us of comics that are really great to get into. I know that for me, when I came back to comics as an adult, it was with Mouse. That's what got me uh, back and and is a book I've taught a lot before. And, you know, I'll also say that stuff like this is, is still really necessary. I taught uh, Mouse a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago now, in a social justice class. And I had students who, it wasn't until they read Mouse, understood that there were concentration camps in Germany. And that surprised me immensely the, the students who hadn't realized they knew that millions of Jews had been killed, but they thought that it was just shoot you on the street, which did happen, Jews were shot on the street, but they didn't realize there was this place where Jews and, and other people that the Nazis didn't like got sent to. And so have, but being able to learn about it in this way with this first person account was definitely one of, I think, the better ways because the student's gonna finish that book or some dry history book that I might have given about this experience maybe wouldn't have gotten read and then the idea never would have gone in there. So it's important. It's important to read them and to teach them and to study them. All right, I'm gonna leave stop share so that we can all come together. Who has questions? So I invite folks. Oh, Lori, did you have a question? Please go ahead. Dear Karma, and I'm not sure if this falls into this topic or if it's something to be addressed differently, but I'm curious because in sci-fi, I see a lot of kind of this looking at women who are powerful and all of this is kind of negative and all of that um, you see them kind of demeaned by well men understand this and women are just pat it you know pat them on the head type thing do you see that in comics and if you do is there a way or a kind of an inroad that you could address young people to, to kind of maybe change that yeah, there, there are some contemporary comics 
um like the the girl genius comics um that are out right now are really good about that there is a really lovely comic whose name i do not remember but ada loveless uh is one of the main protagonists in it so we have we definitely have a shift there just like arguably we have a shift in sci-fi right now where we are wanting those strong women and those strong female voices but yeah comics and sci-fi both suffered the same problems for a long time and that's that most of the artists and most of the readers were male. And so it was this echo chamber of sexist ideas. There was, I mean, in the 1950s for sci-fi, uh, uh, I mean, the stories, there's a story about how women are actually controlling men, that all women are aliens and all women are manipulating men. And it's supposed to be this ha, ha cute, funny story, but it's about how, like, you can tell we're aliens because we get colder easier and that's why we always want to put on a sweater and just like ridiculous stuff like that or you know that that there are all of those stories about men going to some planet and all these women are so horny and everything and that may or may not be dangerous but <laughs> the astronauts are sure gonna find out <laughs> And, and yeah, that, that echo chamber is dangerous. Uh, one of my favorite sci-fi authors is Octavia Butler, uh, who is, of course, from California and should be on every reading list. Um, but Octavia Butler, I heard her uh, talk once about how when she started going to sci-fi conventions in the 70s, she would be usually the only woman there of writers usually the only black person she was also very statuesque and so she was this statuesque black woman towering over these white but really having to push hard both against the sexism and the racism and uh one of my favorite books by her dawn uh the protagonist is african-american but they put a white woman on the first cover fearing that people would not buy the book without white lady on the front. Uh, so yeah, it, we've had the same problems. We're pulling out in the same ways. And luckily comics and sci-fi have both become more welcoming spaces <laughs> for everyone. Um, but of course what, what sci-fi and of course sci-fi and comics overlap because there are sci-fi comics, but you know, what they, what they are able to give us often is is a way to look at our society and sort of say is that is that how we want to organize it <laughs> especially sci-fi like look at this organization pattern what about this do we like that we could <laughs> take out and <laughs> steal or what what in this seeming utopia is not i was teaching a doctor who course a couple years ago and i gave them the choice to pick some of their themes that they wanted to do and they picked utopia but then we're just so upset that every single episode is actually a dystopia and i'm like what story did you think was going to happen where everything was perfect and then there's no story like you can't <laughs> we went to a perfect place and had fun that's not a tv show something's got to go wrong <laughs> So I'm 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 really glad that that's there. Uh, one of my one of my favorite people in the whole world, Scott Shaw, who was one of the one of those first Comic Con members back when Comic Con was about comics and back when it was like in church basements and stuff. You know, he will often talk about just how different it was and how anybody who was interested in comics must be just some boy and must be you know in arrested development that you can't possibly like these things once you're older and you shouldn't like these if you're a girl and you know <laughs> that's not true i loved uh all of the justice league not just wonder woman and i was that kid that i <laughs> I made out of a shoebox a hall of justice. I made myself paper dolls of the Justice League. <laughs> like, that was me <laughs> as a kid, um, which just seems so silly now because, of course, most children now just I'll just buy you that Justice League and the dolls, but you know, <laughs> I was making them myself. 
because I, you know, my parents weren't going to buy me a bunch of stuff and they didn't have as many action figures back when we were kids either. Oh, no, I sound like an old person back in my day. <laughs> we had to make our own. <laughs> Who else has a question? Now that I sound like an old woman. I invite folks and um, uh, feel free to raise your hand, unmute yourself or type your question into chat. Karma, I have a question. Um, kind of given this fact that we're having today's event virtually over Zoom when normally we would be in person, what is happening with graphic novels and comic books as ebooks now? I think that there's something so, especially with the graphic novel or, or comic, the physicality of that there text is. is so important. And what, what's happening with the shift towards ebooks or the, the demand now, especially for ebooks right. as options? Well, I mean, it's definitely. <sighs> Yeah, the, the pandemic is hurting this industry like it's hurting the others, right? It's everything sort of slowed down and a bunch of things went because you still need people in the room to print those copies and to do those things. And even to get the ebook out, you have to have a team of people who are making that happen. And it's not always, you're not always able to work from home or work in a socially distanced way. And so there's definitely been a disruption in some of the systems. And then of course, a lot of people who, you know, were creating some of those newer comics while also holding this kind of job, a lot of the burgeoning authors, like the pandemic has screwed them over because there isn't time while you're educating your children and also <laughs> having every meeting or Zoom to also have any time to be working on, on your actual projects. So it's affected that. I, I am really lucky in that, uh, you know, when, when you're a certain kind of nerd, you have a relationship with your comic book guy who will send you a message and say, I've like got 10 comics for you here. Do you want me to drop them off or are you going to go pick them up? Um, so I still had access to what's coming out and I, and I don't like to read the ebook versions of these. You're right. There, there's something to having it, especially for the color. And um, you know, when I do read electronically, it's on my Kindle. Um, I, I don't feel like it translates that well, but it is something that we'll have to embrace. And I, and I do have a couple of graphic novels in PDF form where I've had to like find it so I could use it in class in a certain way too. So I have them, but yeah, I want, I want my comic book in my hand or on my shelf. Yeah. <laughs> Cause if you're a book person, you always want all the books that ever booked. <laughs> Any other questions? I have another question about yeah. kind of the graphic content of graphic novels. So Karma, you are a part of the selection committee um, that gave the recommendation that ultimately um, resulted in Marbles being this year's Campus Community Book Project. And you'll know from conversations with that selection committee, there was some concern with this particular book about mm -hmm. the graphic content, in particular nudity. And that's something right. that, you know, in my readership of graphic novels, which um, is, is pretty, is, is limited, it seems that that's something that's con consistent within this larger genre to have that more graphic, explicit content. But at the same time, that to me is really interesting because there is that notion that, oh, comics, graphic novels, these are for children. And you have this very adult content. So hoping you could speak more to that. Yeah, I mean, and and this gets tied to anything that we dismiss as just for kids. Like if you dismiss all animated TV shows and movies for kids, then your kids are gonna see some weird things that they should not see. Archer is not for children. Do not <laughs> put it on for the five-year-old. That's It's not made for that. Um, and so some of that is just, if you don't have much experience in a genre, then there are going to be some misunderstandings. Like I, I vividly remember when The Nightmare Before Christmas came out, it got a rating that was not G because it was not for little it'll biddle kids. But so many parents would complain and ask movie theaters for their money back because they took their kids to a PG movie and it wasn't G. And the movie people were like, we have these ratings. <laughs> Here. And the parents are like, but it's animated, therefore it is for children. And, and I remember vividly that argument um, way back in the in the early 90s when that happened. So we're we're just having that same argument again and again, sort of. And 
you know, the, as I alluded to, we have that with what's on TV. And uh, when I, when I go to Europe every once in a while, you know, you'll see a lot more nudity on their television, like Sex in the City was able to just show on network there, whereas sort of we had to have it on HBO. Um, and there was only one scene that got censored off of whichever BBC one, two or three or five, I don't remember which one it was on, but because nudity isn't as big a deal over there, what they have bigger problems with is violence. Whereas it feels like in America, no, it can be really violent, but we shouldn't see boobs. Children could never handle seeing that. <laughs> um, and of course, many people have noted too that, you know, we tend to think sex is okay as long as something goes wrong. But if there's ever just consenting sex between two happy people, that's got to be X-rated and children shouldn't be nowhere allowed near it. But then you can be watching CSI or SVU and talk about how one person strangled another person to death and see the body of the strangled person. And it's like, oh, that's fine. So we, we as a nation have ideas that most other nations are like, your stuff is too violent. And what is your hang up about a naked, just a naked person? Um, and, and we have been raised with that, that weird disconnect. Um, and, you know, like definitely I, I'm sure this novel is gonna be a shock when you turn some of the pages like, oh, naked person. But <laughs> and discussions of that, but it's still part of that life. And when, when, um, when dealing with mania for that person, part of that does of course bleed over into the sex life and it would be disingenuous not to talk about that. So I'm glad that we are. Um, again, you have to, to know that there's an audience appropriate for that, but it's something that, that we have to grapple with. Sometimes with my, um, my pre-med students, um, when we're working with whatever we've chosen for the campus book project, if it intersects at all, sometimes if sex even comes up without even being sort of in graphic novel format, you'll have some people go, oh, well, talking about sex is weird. I'm like, you can't go to med school and, <laughs> and not be able to keep a straight face if somebody brings sex up I said, because then how are you going to treat your patient because they'll know if talking about this makes you uncomfortable and they'll stop and then you won't know what they need help with so we do need to get exposed to some of these things just if we're going to be able to help each other and take care of each other but yeah but i do i definitely know what you're talking about in terms of the room of people like are you sure just like with the um the other book that we had the sherman alexi book where right a kid talks about masturbating yeah I mean he's a teenage boy and a lot of people were like no <laughs> not just at Davis but that book has been banned in a lot of libraries because it acknowledges the existence of teenage masturbation <laughs> anything else we want to talk about So I see we're at one o'clock. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to put up my last slide for folks. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Karma, for joining us today. It's always a pleasure. Karma has been such a huge supporter of the book project for years and years, and we're always um, happy to have you involved, both on the back end and in our presentations. I want to share with folks um, that Karma will be returning um, later this quarter. We have Karma for like five events this year, but the next one that you that we have you for Karma is a screening and discussion of the movie Inside Out, the Pixar movie. Mm -hmm. um, that is happening on Tuesday, December 1st at noon. I put into chat um, the registration link. Um, my colleague Sunny just put into chat a link to our book project event recordings and to a calendar of our upcoming events. Um, this event um, does, um, we'll have a recording for it and that will be put up on the book project website for anyone who is interested in sharing or in viewing again. So I want to thank everyone for joining us so much and wishing everyone a wonderful afternoon.